Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge the local custodians of the land in which we're meeting today and on elders past, present and emerging. I'm Melissa Wilkinson from the Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. Welcome. I'm sitting on the beautiful Dark and Jung land at Avoca Beach and it's such a stunning day. Um, thank you all for being here with us. Just a bit of housekeeping. Um, I strongly encourage you to utilise the questions box. This is your time to do that and uh, time allowing we will get to that at the end of the session. Any questions that we don't get to I will forward on to the presenters and they'll follow up via email after the event as well. So get those questions in nice and early because we're expecting quite a few. Um, so hop into that and utilise that facility. Uh, we are being recorded today and a copy of this will be available on our education library in the coming days. So that's a great resource for you to be able to refer back to. Copies of the presentations will also be there and uh, the video also that will be shown later. After the um, webinar finishes, we'll be going up into the poll. Now that data is used to plan future events and is really important to us, so we really value your input and uh, strongly encourage you to please complete that. I'll introduce the speakers now and uh, thank you all for being with us as well. We have uh, Peter Mullins and Jolene Stewart from our uh, digital health team at the PHN, welcome. Um, Dr. Cecily Forsyth, who is a clinical uh, hematologist. Did I get that right, Cecily? Hematologist, yes, from the Central Coast. Welcome, Cecily. And we have um, Max from the Digital Health Agency. Welcome as well for Australian Digital Health. Thank you. I'm going to hand over now um, to Max to commence the seminar and thank you, everyone. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for those introductions, Mel. Um, Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to the session today. So for my part of the session, I'm going to be talking about my health record uh, for medical uh, specialists. So as Mel mentioned, my name is Max and I work as a digital health educator with the Australian Digital Health Agency. So our learning objectives um, for today are to go over my health record and when you can use it. We're going to look at some of the benefits around using my health record, understanding the clinical information that's available uh, within my health record, and uh, the policies that are required when you're setting up uh, access to my health record. And uh, we're also going to go through um, how to include my health record in your in your workflow as well. So first off, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the National Digital Health Strategy. So the Australian Digital Health Agency has been working on the strategy in cooperation with the Council of Australian Governments. So the strategy is tasked with improving health outcomes for Australians through the use of digital health, education, as well as supporting healthcare providers nationally to implement digital health tools into their practice. Uh, so that, that definitely includes um, specialists implementing digital health tools into their practice. So in the strategy, as you can see, we have uh, seven priority areas. So some of you may be familiar with my health record, but I'm going to be talking a little bit more about my health record today. Uh, then we have um, secure messaging so that information can be exchanged securely. We have uh, data quality, and we all know the importance of keeping quality records um, for our patients. Uh, we have medicine safety. Um, so within medicine safety has been the release of uh, electronic prescriptions as well. We have enhanced models of care, uh, workforce and education. And finally, we have uh, driving innovation. So today I'm, I'm mostly going to be focusing on my health record, which is the first priority uh, within our seven priority pillars there. So my health record is not something new. It's been around for many, many years. Um, and so currently we have 23.3 um, million my health records or people with people with a my health record. And within that um, 23 million, 22.5 million records have data within them. So nine out of 10 Australians have a my health record. Um, so most of you um, online today would, would have a My Health Record as well. So just to give you a bit of an overview of what My Health Record is, it's essentially a secure online summary of an individual's health information. Um, My Health Record is personally controlled, so a person can choose how much they interact with their record, 
uh, if they want to, they can actually upload documents themselves or they can set access controls uh, if they have any concerns around privacy. Uh, it's part of a national system as well, so it's available all around Australia and it's accessible at any time of the day. As long as healthcare providers are connected to my health record, they can access it to uh, view information for an individual that they're caring for. There's also a number of different security measures to ensure data remains safe and secure. So uh, there's data encryption, firewalls, 24 hour system monitoring. And my health record is not only protected under cybersecurity, but there's also um, legislation in, in place to ensure the correct use of the system. So how are healthcare providers um, using my health record at the moment? So at the moment we have 99% um, of pharmacies that are registered and 99% uh, are using my health record. So um, when they are uh, dispensing medications, that information is going through to my health record. So there's a lot of valuable medication information coming from pharmacies. Um, also 99% of GPs are registered and connected. And so from GPs, there's a wealth of information coming from them. So there's the um, prescription information, diagnosis, allergy information, immunization data. So that's coming from general practices. Then we also have 95% of hospitals that are, that are using my health record. And so when, um, when hospitals are connected, their uh, discharge summaries are getting uploaded to my health record. So that information can be quite beneficial for specialists to be able to access that uh, discharge information through my health record. And currently we have uh, 14 million discharge summaries that have been uploaded to my health record. Um, also a majority of private hospitals are connected around Australia as well. Um, so they're also uploading uh, those discharge summaries as well. So you can see both public and private on my health record. Um, also currently uh, uh, we can see here that 22% of specialists are registered to my health record. So um, uh, in this space at the moment, uh, we're, we're really encouraging specialists to get on board. Uh, uh, with using my health record and um, and there's so many benefits to using the system. Um, it is a great system, so we're happy to help and support you to, to get involved as well. So as you can see, 10% um, have now used my health record and these numbers are continuing to increase. So we're seeing more and more, uh, uh, more and more specialists registering with my health record. So, as a specialist, uh, you can benefit through using My Health Record because it provides you with quick and easy access to health information um, that, that you may not have access to unless you have access to My Health Record, um, or it could be further information that you get access to through My Health Record. There's also less administrative burden for gathering patient information, so you don't have to rely on um, receiving the discharge summary from the hospital. You can actually just go onto my health record for a patient that you're looking after and look at their discharge summary. Um, there's also improved clinical decision-making uh, in terms of um, having access to more information really does help with uh, making decisions for your patients. Uh, so for example, um, allergies um, are documented through also by patients within my health record. So they, that can ensure that allergies don't get missed, um, uh, which can really help with um, uh, providing the appropriate patient care. Um, then there's also avoidance of uh, duplication of tests, scans and, um, and uh, diagnostic imaging reports as well. So um, you can see those uh, reports in my health record. Uh, and also it can help to inform end of life care decisions. So um, if you're wondering who can actually access my health record, so you have the authority to access my health record uh, if you are permitted by your organization. Um, so your organization has connected to my health record and added you as uh, someone who has access to the record uh, and also um, you can access it provided that, um, that you are, are providing healthcare um, to the patient. So you're authorized to access it providing that you are, are, are giving healthcare to the patient. Um, so my health record must not be in, uh, 
used for insurance purpose or pre-employment pre assessment. Um, so it's only for use of providing healthcare to patients. You also have the authority to upload documents to my health record. Um, unless a, a patient is asking you not to upload a document, then you would have that discussion with them as to the potential implications on future healthcare decisions if that information is not being shared with other providers. Um, also with uploading of shared health summaries, that's uploaded by the nominated healthcare provider, which is the regular provider um, uh, for the patient. And, uh, and then you have um, certain state and territory laws that require consent before uploading sensitive health information. But really it is best practice in general, if you are uploading sensitive health information that you check with the patient before uploading it as well. So uh, this is some of the documents that are available in my health record. And currently we have 629 million documents in my health record that have been uploaded by healthcare providers as well as consumers as well. So there's a lot of documents within my health record and the documents fall under three categories. So you have those um, uploaded by healthcare providers, by consumers themselves and through Medicare as well. So some of your uh, provider documents uh, would include the shared health summaries from general practices, discharge summaries from hospitals, pathology reports, diagnostic imaging reports, um, prescription records. So there's a wealth of um, information, healthcare information coming from provider documents. Then you also have consumers uploading documents. So they can actually upload a personal health summary if they want to share that with their healthcare providers, personal health notes. They can upload advanced care plans, uh, emergency contacts and childhood development as well. Then you have also Medicare documents pulling through. So you have your MBS and PBS um, claims coming through. Then you have your organ donor register status and you have access to the Australian Immunisation Register information pulling through from Medicare. Now in the middle, you'll see these overview documents. So these, are, these combine all of the other documents, as I mentioned, um, there is um, 629 million documents. So they combine all the information from documents and then they put it into a summarized view for you. So you get a summarized view of the medicine view, summarization of the Medicare in the Medicare overview, immunization view as well, pathology and diagnostic imaging overviews. So first up, I'm gonna show you the medicines information view. And this is one of the first documents accessed by healthcare providers because of the amount of relevant clinical information uh, you can find in here. So um, within the uh, medicines view, um, you can find dispense records from pharmacies, prescribing records from general practices, um, you can find Medicare information pulls through, shared health summaries, discharge summaries. So all of this information is pulling through into the medicine view. So in our navigation panel, you'll see here we have allergies and adverse reactions. And as I mentioned, patients can actually add in their own um, personal health summaries and add in information about their allergies. Um, then you have your medicines preview. So medicines preview looks like um, this below. So we can see here the medications our patient is on. And this is especially beneficial, beneficial when our patient is on multiple medications and they can't remember the exact details. You can check it here in my health record and you can actually click on these links and it'll take you through to the source document where the information has come from. Then we also have uh, shared health summaries uh, and uh, discharge summaries as well. So you can access that all through Medicines View. And I'm just doing a quick overview. If you'd like more in-depth um, in uh, uh, training around using my health record, please feel free to um, sign up for one of our webinars um, and I'll give you those uh, links at the end of the presentation today. Um, so uh, then you also have your immunization consolidated view. And so here we can see immunization information pulling through air. So you don't have to go through those steps of logging onto the Australian Immunization Register. You can actually find this information in my health record just with a few clicks. Um, then you can also see immunization information pulling through from shared health summaries and event summaries as well within my health record. There's also a COVID-19 immunization status and we can find out if, if they're up to date, otherwise when the next immunization is due as well. 
So there's also a pathology uh, and diagnostic imaging reports overview. So you have all the various pathology and diagnostic imaging reports coming through to my health record, and this gives us a, that summarized view. So the um, so the pathology uh, overview is grouped according to test name and collection date. And you can see on the left here, who's the organization that is connected to my health record and they have uploaded the pathology reports. Now, um, there is a massive amount of um, pathology providers that are connected because uh, currently we have 206 million pathology reports um, within my health record, um, but they do need to be connected to my health record to upload. And you can actually see on our website who are the diagnostic imaging and pathology providers that are connected. And you can check and you can send patients to uh, those ones that are connected. Otherwise, um, there's ways that you can connect um, between pathology providers and practices as well. Um, now, uh, if for example, your patient uh, is a diabetic patient, they've had their HbA1c, uh, you can then click here to, to view the report. And the diagnostic imaging report uh, overview looks, looks quite similar to this as well. Uh, then you have your Medicare uh, documents as well. Um, so Medicare, the Medicare overview includes information such as prescription information. So you have your PBS and RBPS information pulling through. You have air information coming through um, from Medicare. You have the organ donor register. So this is just the status um, uh, for your patient. It's not actually the register. It's, it's just the status for their organ donation. Um, and then you have your MBS and DVA items. Um, so this is your Medicare services. So you can see here who are the other service providers that are claiming um, within your patient's healthcare team. You can see a description of what's being claimed and then you can see the item number. So this can be quite beneficial if you're looking to see if your patient is eligible to claim certain services, you can find that and track that through the Medicare services part of the Medicare overview. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we also do have shared health summaries coming through from uh, general practices. And uh, the shared health summary uh, gives us a snapshot of a patient's health status at a point in time. So it includes information in four key areas. So you have your allergies and adverse reactions, your medications, medical history, and immunizations. And so these documents are uploaded by the patient's nominated healthcare provider. And really that makes sense because um, it's all the, the information or the, the health data actually comes from their clinical information system. And all they need to do is click some boxes to verify that, um, that the information is correct. Uh, and then uh, it, all, it all pulls through into my health record in, in, uh, as a shared health summary. Um, so the nominated healthcare provider or regular healthcare provider uh, could be a registered nurse. They can upload shared health summaries. Um, medical practitioners can also upload them or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander healthcare practitioners as well. So another, another key document in my health record uh, is the event summary. And this captures key information about a significant healthcare event. So it's relevant to the ongoing care of the patient. Um, so it could indicate a clinical intervention and improvement in a condition or a treatment that's been started or completed. Um, and so the, uh, the event summary gives you an opportunity to write notes. Otherwise, once you've seen your patient, uh, all you do is tick a box to say that you want all that information uploaded to my health record. Um, so um, you can you can attend our session if you want to learn more about uploading of event summaries. So these these can be uploaded by uh, medical practitioners, by nurses, uh, including enrolled nurses, even allied health. Um, when they're connected to my health record, uh, they can also be uploading uh, the event summaries. And here's an example of a specialist letter. So you may be interested um, uh, in the specialist letter. So uh, as you can see here, this is what it looks like um, within my health record. And this is a function that specialists have been keen for us to be able to offer the uploading a specialist letter. General practices are very keen for this as well. They really wanna see that information pulling through um, um, from specialist letters. And this is what the generic letter looks like. 
Uh, and if you have access to certain software, so certain software have this functionality where you can actually upload a um, PDF version with the brand and logo as well um, for the specialist letter. So the specialist letter really saves time and money for other healthcare providers trying to access that health information, but it also improves that continuity of care for our patients. So how can um, um, my health record add value to your clinical practice? So uh, it can add value by allowing access to um, medication information. So it can really help with doing the medication reconciliation tasks, um, prescribing medications, and that information can be tracked through uh, medicines information view. Can also help with um, getting information around history taking, patient assessments. Um, so that can be shared through uh, the shared health summaries and discharge summaries as well. As I mentioned, it can avoid that duplicating of test scans. Um, if you can access it through My Health Record, you don't need to send your patient off to get another blood test so that you can see the results. Uh, you'll be able to access that information through My Health Record. So that's your pathology and diagnostic imaging reports as well. Uh, and it helps to inform end of life care decisions with the advanced care planning documentation. So here at the agency, we often get a lot of questions around security um, and there are many safeguards in place um, to ensure that data remains safe and secure. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got strong encryption firewalls, we've got secure login processes. Um, there's also audit logging as well. Um, and the cybersecurity team uh, monitors the system 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, the health information is also protected under legislation and there can be um, significant penalties for misuse of that information. So for example, if someone was logging onto, um, onto a uh, celebrity's account, um, then that could be tracked and there could be um, significant penalties for that because they're not looking after them. But if they are looking after them, that's fine. Um, all data is stored um, within the My Health Record system. So it's stored within Australia and uh, anyone any uh, any software that wants to connect to my health record has to go through a conformance process to ensure that they are appropriate to connect to the system. Uh, so patients are also in control of their my health record. So and this is really to help uh, ensure patients who have concerns about their information um, being shared out there, they can actually control their record as well. So I've I've actually spoken to individuals myself. Um, that have, have chosen uh, not to have a My Health Record in the past because they didn't want that information shared. And when I told them about these access or these um, the ability to uh, set these access codes, then they, then they decided to go ahead and, and re-sign up again. Um, so patients can access to, um, can create what are called limited document access codes. They don't have to restrict access to their whole record, just certain documents that, uh, as a provider, you would need to ask them for their code before you would be able to view those documents. And, um, and also, uh, they can set a record access code. So you'd, be, you'd need to ask them for their code prior to accessing their, their My Health record. In an emergency, there is a break glass facility, so you can still access the record, but provided that it is for an emergency. Um, and so that needs to be documented that it was for an emergency. Patients can also choose to receive notification if their if their uh, My Health record has been accessed. And as I mentioned, um, My Health record uh, access is monitored and logged. So how can speciali specialists um, use My Health record? Um, so having a look at this slide here gives us a bit of an idea of how the, the system works. So um, as a healthcare provider, you can view uh, My Health Record through a conformant um, software. Uh, otherwise, if you don't have access to a conformant software yet, you can use the national provider portal to, to view documents. And uh, you can also upload documents through conformant software. And as patients, uh, they can view, or you as a consumer yourself, you can view your own My Health record through uh, going to MyGov, and you can actually upload documents onto your own My Health record, uh, or you can use authorized apps as well to view uh, My Health record. 
so as I mentioned, um, as a provider in, in, in private practice, uh, you can access my health record through a conformant um, software. That's act so this is, what, this is what it would look like. And we do have a register of conformity on our website. So you can always check to see if your software is conformant with my health record, or you can use the national provider portal. Now, the thing about the national provider portal, it's, it's for viewing. Um, so you wouldn't be able to upload documents that, like you can within a conformant software. So you can upload documents when you do have access to this conformant software. Um, so uh, with the national provider portal, uh, you would be viewing, you can't upload, but you can still download, uh, you can still print documents. So you still have access to that valuable health information that's available in my health record. Um, so at the Australian Digital Health Agency, we have partnered with specialist um, software providers and vendors to integrate the My Health Record system into their current clinical information systems. So as you can see, there is a number of software providers that are in the build and test phase. Um, uh, and um, so these ones will have My Health Record access in the future, but there's also a lot of software providers that already do have My Health Record access. So um, if you use any of these softwares, you would be able to access My Health Record through your software. And as I mentioned, um, please feel free to attend one of our training sessions and we can take you through how to access um, My Health Record uh, through your software. So how can you get connected and start using My Health Record? So before using My Health Record, it's important to know um, that, you, that you need to create or your organization needs to create a My Health uh, Security and Access Policy. And so uh, this is a legislative requirement as part of the uh, My Health Records Rule of 2016. Um, and so there are template policies um, that you can access to, to create your own policy. So RAC, RACP has one or um, the Royal Australian uh, College of General Practitioners has one as well. So you could use the RACP one as a specialist, um, as a template um, to create your own policy. Otherwise, you can also find resources on our website as well if you want to create um, your own, uh, your, your policy as well. So, um, what what do you need to know um, or what do you need to do as an organization that's connecting to my health record so there are certain requirements um, so as i mentioned one of those requirements is having that security the my health record security and access policy in place and then you would be able to uh, register for my health record but some of the ongoing requirements include training for staff and that's where um, adha can become really helpful we can uh, we can show your staff how to use My Health Records so they can register for our webinars and, and uh, register for any training sessions. Um, then you've also got um, uh, con uh, confirming with the uh, process of using My Health Record. So you need to uh, choose who are the authorized staff within your organization who do have access. And then also ongoing um, participation and uh, with, with the use of, of My Health Record. So to get connected, uh, if you want to set up to get connected today, uh, just give our connections team. Uh, we have a specialist connections team at the agency. Uh, just give them a call on this number. Otherwise, uh, you could also email them your interest as well. Or you can also get support from the Hunter New England and Central Coast PHN as well. So you can email them uh, digitalhealth at, at the phn.com.au. So some of our um, resources that are available on our website. So we have the, um, the Digital Health Specialist Toolkit. And so in the Specialist Toolkit, there are fact sheets, um, user implementation guides. We have FAQs. We also have modules as well. So um, you can access this information um, uh, through the Digital Health website. And I'm going to show you shortly uh, what it looks like um, accessing our resources as well. And then you can go to training.digitalhealth.gov.au if you want to access the e-learning modules, as well as um, videos for demonstration and podcasts there as well. So if you do want any further information, um, uh, please feel free to go to the Australian Digital Health Agency website. 
Um, so uh, at digitalhealth.gov.au. Uh, there's also the My Health Record website where there is a lot of information, but um, a lot of that information has actually been migrated onto the digitalhealth.gov.au website. You can also call the My Health Record helpline uh, on this number and select two for providers. Um, and uh, you can also email us at help at digitalhealth.gov.au. So I'm just going to show you what the resource, what our resources look like. Um, just give me a moment while my screen is setting up. Okay, so when you go to the digitalhealth.gov.au website, you can actually click here. Um, you can see here information for everyone around uh, use of my health record, so you can um, pass this information on to um, to your your patients or or anyone that you know is interested in learning more around um, use of my health record. Otherwise, you can go to the healthcare providers tab, and this is where you'll find um, a lot of resources. So, as you can see here, we have um, resources for specialists. Um, I'm just getting a bit of feedback. I think someone might have unmuted themselves. If they could uh, mute themselves, that would be very much appreciated. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, you can see here, um, there is resources for specialists. Uh, then you've also got um, resources within aged care, allied health, community pharmacies, hospitals, GPs. So there's a lot of resources on our website. And then you can see the various initiatives and programs. So we have electronic prescribing, telehealth, secure messaging. So we have um, all of these different initiatives where you can find out further information that you need. And this is the really helpful part here is the training and support. So here you can access um, on-demand training resources so you can practice uploading documents to my health record um, we also have events and webinars so this is where you would um, uh, you could potentially send your staff to sign up for any events or webinars or if you'd like to learn a little bit more about using various um, clinical information systems you can uh, sign up for our training and webinars and then we've also got our online training courses so here you can see we have um, a lot of um, a lot of modules on uh, how to use uh, my health record, active script list, electronic prescribing, introduction to to my health record, preparing for my health record. So there's a lot of resources there as well, and there's also digital health um, for specialists is is another resource there too. Now I did mention earlier. Um, that if you type in pathology and diagnostic imaging providers that are connected to my health record you'll be able to see all of the all of the providers that are connected so up the top here we do have the um, pathology providers that are connected now lavity pathology has many many labs um, so if you send your patients to uh, any of these um, dorovich uh, Lavity, QML, any of these, you'll be able to, those those reports will be automatically uploaded to My Health Record. So there's many options here and they're, they're set according to state. So depending on which state you're in, uh, you can send, in Queensland, you can be sending patients to MARTA Pathology and then those reports would be automatically uploaded to My Health Record. So these are some of the main pathology providers around Australia that are connected. Now, there are other providers that require um, a connection process between the practice and the provider. And so these are the ones that require to go through that, that uh, connecting process. Okay, so um, I, hope, I hope this um, presentation was helpful. I will be sticking around at the end for some questions and answers. Um, so uh, that's that's it for me. I'll hand it over to you, Peter. Thanks, Max. I'll just set my screen up. Wait for a second. Okay. Can you see my screen, Mel? All good. Yes. All good. Yeah. Excellent. Alrighty. 
Um, so thank you everyone for coming on this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to do is really just cover off on some fairly general uh, digital health topics and, and some of the tools and also look at some of that foundational uh, some of the foundational pillars I think that you need to get in place uh, when you're embarking or continuing on your digital health journey. Uh, I wanted to put up a quick definition of um, what is digital health and I think this is a really good one that I stole from somebody, I'm not going to claim this one. Um, but digital health, it's a disruptive and transformational approach to the delivery of healthcare with a focus on engaging and empowering patients, activating caregiver networks and understanding that patients are increasingly behaving as consumers of healthcare. Digital health provides us with a toolbox of technologies and techniques that support the development of new, innovative patient and caregiver centred models of care, driving improved engagement, accessibility, quality, safety, efficiency and sustainability in all corners of the health system. Uh, the bit that I really like about that is that patients are increasingly behaving as consumers of healthcare and digital health initiatives are really driving that. They're really uh, able to access more information, you know, whether that be through my health record, but also through information that they're you know, providing themselves. A lot of people are wearing wearables, they've got apps on their phones and things like that. So that sort of technology is becoming more and more uh, relevant in, uh, in a patient's holistic healthcare. Um, but looking at some of the basics as we get into it uh, and, and what, what are the things that you need to make sure you've got in place and data security is a key one. Uh, we've got, you know, I think I saw a statistic the other day that there's over 2021 there was a 51% increase in healthcare uh, attacks uh, or cyber security attacks. So it's important to make sure that your data security is, is in place. So is your security software that you got, your cyber security software, is it fit for purpose, is it updated? Uh, make sure it's doing everything you need it to do. Um, secure messaging, so I'll go back one step on that security software. A lot of people I think think when they're in a small medical practice that they're not a target. Uh, I really want to stress that any medical practice or any health uh, organisation is a target and don't think that you know hackers are just an individual lonely person sitting in a room at night. It's organised crime and it is, they're using banks of computers to actually perpetrate it. And, and it flows right across everything you do digitally within the practice. So secure messaging, uh, do you use it for both incoming and outgoing? Do you have capacity for both? Should you have capacity for both? And in most circumstances, that's going to, the answer to that's going to be yes. You should be able to receive and send using uh, secure messaging. So there's a lot of products out there, you know, Argus, Medical Objects, HealthLink, that are all there in the marketplace. Um, are you receiving encrypted e-referrals? So in the Hunter New England region, we have 90% of practices, general practices, enabled to use the CENT e-referral system. That can be used, uh, there's a receiving end of that. We can have private specialists and allied health professionals listed in that software so you can actually receive those referrals from GPs into a secure website. And if you'd like some more information on that, all our contact details are there here at the end. Um, what do you use email for and do you, um, you know, do you use email to receive or send patient information. Really, that's something you need to be concerned about if you are. Um, it's really considered a high risk unless that information is encrypted. Uh, fax or, um, are you using faxes for that information? Faxes don't play nicely with the NBN, uh, but it's important also to consider if you're using an e-fax system, does that actually involve the use of emails? And if you look at it, most of the e-fax systems actually receive the fax, convert it to an email and send it to your inbox. So that information could actually be sitting, if you're working in an Office 365 environment, sitting on Microsoft service. Uh, remote access, again, a lot of us are remotely working from home and remoting into the system. But if you've got a, you know, if yourself if, or one of your staff is sitting at home with a Windows 7 home, hasn't been upgraded since then, is running a free version of software, uh, security software, that's a big threat. So it's only you know, your access to your system is really got to be, yeah, sorry, start again. <laughs> Access to your system, you've really got to look at who's accessing and how that, that access is being facilitated. And also, are your staff trained and regularly updated about cyber security? Make sure they're thinking of it, make sure they're not just getting an email and clicking on it. Make sure they're thinking about what it is that they're actually reacting to and things like that. Use permissions, have you got the permissions in your practice at the right level? So can staff work effectively within their job scope? Who needs administrator level access and who doesn't? So can your reception staff, can they reverse an incorrect billing, but alternatively, can they not install a program? Does your practice manager have access to the right uh, 
administrator levels, can they change a printer, can they install a printer, can they install a program if they need to without having to contact your IT. That comes down to a couple of things, do they have comfort level of doing that, do they have the technical ability to do that, but you've got to tailor that access to make sure your practice can work as effectively as it can. Passwords, can't say it more often than this, password is not a password, password one is not a password. It's amazing how many times I see that. But passwords, they've got to be changed regularly and they've got to be complex. And by complex, we mean eight to 10 digits, preferably a random um, series of numbers, uh, symbols uh, and letters, uppercase, lowercase, but worst case, using uh, you know random words that don't, wouldn't normally be connect, con connected together and, and also implementing or inserting symbols and numbers. So something like you know, 52 green boats with a question mark at the end. That's going to take less time for these banks and computers to actually hack into it. Won't stop it, but they will actually take more time. Backups, very important. Are your backups done daily and are they stored offsite? Um, you can do that either via cloud or an external drive. Um, you know, if you're using an external drive, are you using, they, they talk about the three by three. Um, that's important as well that you've got one on, one off and one already backed up. So make sure you've got your backups in place. Classic example is only a couple of weeks ago with the floods up at uh, Lismore, a practice up there lost not only their, their primary uh, data, but also their backup data because it wasn't off-site. Uh, you can put in place a secondary server. Again, that can be on-site or off-site. The advantage of a secondary server is you have a primary crash, it can be up and running on a secondary um, you know, pretty soon afterwards. And that can also be a server that you'll say, um, you know, you're putting in a new server, you can look at using the old one uh, as, a, as a secondary server. The other important thing, there's no point backing up data unless you've actually tested that you can actually get back up and running from your backup data. So make sure that's tested at least annually, preferably more often, and that's something you probably want to run with your IT uh, suppliers. Uh, some of the digital health tools that, that fall off the back of all of these initiatives, e-prescribing, um, it's a great enhancement, and I know Cecily might talk a little bit more about that shortly, uh, but it's, it really is something that, again, patient is going to be patient-driven. E-scripts e can either be token-based for a single script and also active script lists you can actually have. A patient can have an active script list at a nominated pharmacy where all of their scripts are kept and they can actually access those anytime they go in. They don't actually have to carry the script. One of the things, uh, the, the security that sits behind not only my health record is a NASH certificate and that also sits behind a lot of these other uh, e-prescribing and other digital health initiatives that are coming out. Uh, E-ordering and e-pathology, again, as Max mentioned, that enables um, reports to be uploaded to the My Health Record uh, and it also reduces error rates um, and, you know, because the, the information is transferred securely and digitally the first time, it's not relying on uh, provider input. Uh, your website, um, is it up to date, is it engaging? And is it informative? Does it tell? Does it represent the practice? That, you know your practice the way you want it to be seen. Uh, and there's a lot of information that you can put on a website. that can actually save time for your admin staff if that information is there and accessible by by patients or potential patients. Uh, policies and procedures. Again, Max mentioned policies and procedures. You need to have your policies and procedures in place. Staff need to know the rules of engagement that they're working under. Um, you should have a number of different policies and procedures. And I think the important thing is they are living documents. They're not just put it in the cupboard, let them gather dust. They are they, they need to reflect what you're doing day to day and they need to be updated as your processes or office procedures change. Uh, so make sure they're there and make sure that, they're, as I say, they're regularly reviewed and updated. Um, IT consultants and suppliers. Uh, most people, I think, are probably using uh, an IT company. If you, or if you're doing it yourself, should you be doing it yourself is a question you probably need to ask. Uh, you know, it's, it's that old story, what do you know what you don't know? Uh, does your, but also thinking about if you're looking for an IT supplier, do they have specific health industry knowledge? There's a lot of uh, software uh, in the health industry that needs specific knowledge. Um, not saying it can't be done by uh, someone without that knowledge, but it's, systems generally work and interact a lot better if someone's got specific knowledge. Uh, do they consult with you or they, do they just do the work and, and then send an invoice? Really, as a practice manager or a practice owner, you need to be actively engaged with your IT, knowing what they're doing and driving the actual process rather than actually just getting an invoice and hoping that it's working. Uh, and again, do you or your practice manager know your IT administrator passwords? If your IT business falls over tomorrow, 
can you get up and running with a new company or do they actually have to you know, knock your system down and rebuild it? If you know those passwords, if you can actually pass those passwords on, then your business continuity is, is much more enhanced. Uh, and the question I ask if, if your IT administrator, or sorry, your IT won't give you those passwords, I always ask the question, you know, do, does your IT consult work for you or do you work for them? Um, I'm going to pass over to Cecily very shortly. What I'd like to run now is just a very quick uh, video, about four minutes in total, so I'll put that on and then we'll pass over to Cecily. Um, Peter, it's Mel. I'm just uh, checking. Did you want to reload that one or we can also have it available in the education library for anyone that would like to watch? Oh, it's working now. We're off. It seems it seems to work when it's smaller. The screen. Oh, but no sound now. Last 12 months, we... has increasingly moved to a very electronic focus center or digital focus practice. That sometimes has been a little bit challenging, particularly for me, because I'm the old dinosaur of the practice, but it really has had an enormous benefit. And the things that really have, have happened in COVID to push us along, I think they're three main things. The use of video uh, video calls for telehealth, the use of uh, an availability of e-scripting, which would be my secretary's favorite thing, and thirdly, of course, the introduction of my health record. I use that with every single patient consultation. It's really one click to get into the my health record. And that brings up all the different components of my health record that I may want to access. This is very confidential, so it is only um, accessible by, by me, by the practitioner, with a practitioner login to the system. So there are lots of bits of it that I really like. First of all, the discharge summaries from the hospital, the discharge summaries from every patient in the public system is uploaded and available and extremely accessible. Second, I use the Australian Immunisation um, record really often. And I use that because a lot of my patients are immunocompromised. But I also find the medication uh, and drug availability incredibly useful. So it's very easy to go into the My Health record and immediately access what drugs are being prescribed and being collected, so the which script is being filled from their pharmacy. And that's actually really useful for assessing patient compliance as well. Probably the other thing that I look at regularly from My Health record for patients is if the patient has been seen by another specialist in the Gazette, even if there isn't a letter uploaded from that specialist, there is on the Medicare overview, there is the ability to see who has been paid by Medicare. And therefore I know which respiratory condition they're seeing and our secretarial staff can easily contact and get a letter. So all of my letters that I write are uploaded to my health record and are readily available for other practitioners to look at and importantly available for the juniors in the hospital to have a look at, see the letter, see a management plan, see the diagnosis, because we do know that some of the hospital records aren't as detailed and correct as we would like. There are many other information areas within the My Health record. I use the diagnostic imaging and find that as a good way of obtaining imaging from the hospital. And the same for the hospital blood tests. Uh, that is really useful. There are other uh, sections within the My Health Record, such as allergies and adverse events to drugs, which I do access occasionally. But usually I always ask the patient if they can't remember which drug it is, then that is also another good way of accessing that information without having to read a GP. So there are many components in the My Health Record that I use on a really regular basis that make 
make life easier, save secretarial time, which ultimately is a real benefit. And I probably didn't understand how useful it was going to be when we first got my health record. Just embracing the change in the use of electronic medical records, digital health, over the last five years, probably has been a little bit daunting for someone my age and much more um, taken in your stride for, for 30, 30 year old uh, medical specialist. But actually, I've really enjoyed it. It streamlines the practice, it improves the care for patients, and it makes things much better. So, my sort of advice to people going out and setting up practice is you need to really get a fantastic electronic medical record and billing system that offers you easy access to my health records, improving access to information about the patients, improving accuracy, and uh, generally improving communication amongst specialists with GPs, with the hospital, you know, really on many, many places where this has really just improved uh, care for our patients. Okay, that's that. Thanks, Mel, if you want to um, take that control back. Thanks, Peter. Um, that was great. I'm just having a look at the questions box. If anybody has any questions, um, if you could please send them through or pop them into the chat box. We've uh, allocated a bit of time for that now as well. We might add Cecily, I think, uh, was going to talk as well now. Yes, yes. Hello, um, everybody. Look, uh, basically, as I've uh, said and outlined in that video, I've been using my health record really, I'm going to say roughly about six months. I find it fantastic. I found it a really uh, useful addition to the practice. And I think, you know, one of the things that are really beneficial and that we all find very important is that it actually saves secretarial time. And I just think about access to discharge summaries and I think about how much time it took for my secretarial staff to either log on, set up the VPN, get that discharge summary, ring the hospital, find out that the hospital had a code where the patient needs to sign a consent form before they would release that discharge summary. All of those kind of things, hoops that my secretarial staff would jump through, that are now just so much easier that they're just bypassed on that completely and utterly. And I can get discharge summary, ED presentation with you know one click while the patient is with me, not something that's arriving um, you know the next day and finding out that actually what the patient thought they were in hospital with bore no resemblance to reality or the changes in medication made by the hospital that have not yet filtered through um, to the pharmacy and then onto my health um, and, and then and for the patient to be able to tell us. So I've really found it easy. I found it simple. My letters are there. In fact, after the last uh, the last function that the um, local health district organised, the PNH organised, um, I got a letter from a, a GP saying, "I've just taken over this patient, and I logged onto their My Health record and saw your letter there, and I was so happy, and it was really nice. It was very the next day, and and so you know, communication between between specialist to specialist, between the hospital and ourselves is really just so much improved with this. I tell my team at the beginning of each term, go onto my health record, all my letters are uploaded to my health record, you will find the most recent letter on the patient, it will have the diagnosis in that letter and, and it's really, really useful and in so many circumstances where it's fantastic and especially at end of life, that's another area where often, especially now in COVID times, patients arrive by ambulance often on their own families aren't allowed in the door into ED and it's very clear in my letter what I've discussed with the patient, what the plan is, what they agree to or the, what is not appropriate and it stops me finding my patients who are at the end of their life uh, intubated in ICU. You know those kind of disasters it's really been just uh, really very easy, very straightforward uh, and uh, something I've, I've really embraced and enjoyed. 
uh, um, without taking up too much time because I'm really keen to have questions, the e, e scripts are fantastic and probably most of us have had an e script from our own GP, but actually it's, it is really something that again has been enormously time saving for, for my secretarial staff. So instead of uh, me printing out a script and the secretarial staff faxing it to the chemist of choice, and then we get a call from the patient saying, I didn't go to Bado Bay, I decided to go to Erina, could you refax that script? Um, or the it didn't arrive or the chemist closed because of COVID. It's just really made it so easy for patients to have on their phone. But enormous number of patients actually when they're sitting opposite you say, just to my phone, just to my phone, I don't want it anywhere else. So, you know, they, these things are straightforward, they're simple, there's people to help you use them and they really actually, I think, make, make, make it quite fun, they improve things, it's great. Can't say enough in praise of my health record, e-scripting, enjoy it all, even in quite enjoy the video health. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, if you could pop those uh, into the questions box now, we'll uh, have a look at those. I'll just give you a couple of seconds to do that. And while we're waiting for that, um, I'll just remind you that a survey will pop up at the end of the webinar. Um, please uh, take the time. It takes a couple of minutes to complete that. Uh, also, a copy of the recording and the video. Um, looked like there was a little bit of internet issues going on maybe with the video there, um, Peter, up, up where you are. So um, we'll pop that into the education library as well so you can refer to that as well. That'd be great. There doesn't seem to be uh, any questions coming through so far. If anyone has them, just pop them into the questions box. Um, I might prompt just... one that often comes up, Mel, um, from clinicians and that is around uh, do they need a patient's permission to access uh, a My Health record? Um, yep. that's what it's regularly asked. Do they do they need to actually consent the patient each time they do it? Um, and Max, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, my understanding is that a patient, by having a My Health record, has already given that consent. The consent is um, explicit with that, and so you don't need to consent a patient to either look at their record, provided you've got that. Again, as Max mentioned. The, you're, you're part of the healthcare team that you're actually accessing that. Best practice is talk to them about it and, and tell them that you're going to do that, but uh, you actually don't need their permission to access that information and either upload or download. So, but as I said, best practice is to actually consult with your patient and let them know what they're doing. So, because it is their my, my health record and they're part of that journey as well. Look, I actually, I agree. And I think one of the things that I often do is actually when I'm accessing that my health record, I say to the patient, oh, you okay, you've been in hospital last month. Let's have a look and see what the hospital said. And, and I will show them, say, oh, yep, here's your discharge summary. Isn't that fantastic? You've got a my health record, you know, and I, they'll say, oh, I can't remember what my drugs are. And I'll show them again and say, oh, okay, well, actually, you've got this drug. We forgot about that, didn't we? Oh, yes. And, and you know, that happens for vaccination. I, being a haematologist, you know, it's really important for my immunocompromised patients to be vaccinated. So I am forever looking at their vaccination record and saying to them, no, actually, you didn't have your booster two months ago. You had your booster in November. You're a little bit overdue. And they, and they really are quite shocked. And I think patients less probably than, than, than many of us in working in healthcare, they don't really access their, their Medicare Express app as well to have a look at those things. They probably sometimes aren't as, you know, jumping on all of those things. So they often aren't sure when they got that vaccination dose. And that's really been useful for patients. I say, you're overdue, this is what you need, this is where, and I pop it in the letters to the GP and make sure that it happens. So lots of little things like that, that that patients are, you know, sometimes a little bit misinformed about or not quite uh, up to date. That can really make a difference and make sure that all of the appropriate things for vaccinations, medication doses, and things are done. So, you know, the, com the compliance is fantastic. You say it's very hard to prevent clots if you don't actually pick up the drug from the pharmacy. You know that. <laughs> Mostly one assumes that if they're picking it up, they probably are taking it. And if they're picking it up every month, that's pretty reassuring. But if they're picking it up every three months, you really get quite a feeling for what their compliance is like. And say, you know, if it stays in the bottle, it doesn't usually help. That is very true. Um, oh, yes, no. Sorry, I 100% agree. I, I was just going to say, um, 
the more the more providers around Australia that are connected, the more information that we have in my health record, the better it is for everyone. You know, mm -hmm. it's 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 you as a specialist receiving that information, and then you as a specialist providing that information, so um, so that the patient has the ongoing care. Um, and it's it's um, as um, uh, Dr. Forsyth was saying that it's it is um, it's really about uh, patient safety as well. You know, having access to that medication information, ensuring that they have the right information about their medications and they're taking it appropriately, uh, avoiding them from missing medications. Um, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So it's uh, having the more people that get connected, um, the better the system becomes. It is amazing the increase. You know, I think when we first went on, and I'm going to say it was six months ago because that's roughly whatever, whenever it was, so that sometime last year, there wasn't very much pathology in there. And that pathology in there is now really taken off. And I get a lot of pathology coming into my software system electronically, and we just ask them, you know, whoever to download it. But um, New South Wales Health always takes time and being able to go in there and see what's been done at the hospital and avoid duplication of expensive pathology tests, you know, really, really makes a difference. It's really, really useful. And the same with imaging from the hospital as well. You know, those getting that sent across takes time. It takes ties up your secretarial time. So I really appreciate that. And, and in fact, uh, I had a patient this week who saw me and I said, look, I'm really concerned about the amount of imaging that's being done. You're having this done here. You're having this done by your second GP and you're having that done by the hospital. What's triggering these presentations with symptoms that people are all doing these scans and you know and, and you can sort of address that um, some of those problems and some of your concerns about excessive imaging you know from a patient safety point of view let alone Medicare funding point of view. Okay well thank you um, I've just checked the box again it seems that you've covered everything so that that's a very positive thing um, very good outcome and if anyone else has uh, any other questions that they think of later up to the seminar closes, uh, you can always um, text me or email me on education at the phm.com.au and I will pass those questions on to the presenters for you as well. So just a reminder that uh, the survey will pop up once again. Um, please complete that, it only takes a couple of moments. So thank you to all of you for being here with us today. There's some great content covered and it was really interesting and um, important topics. So thank you so much. Have a beautiful afternoon everybody. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.